Good morning. As we uh, gather for worship, we're uh, glad to be here on this Lord's Day. We have others who are still coming in the sanctuary from parking the cars or from various uh, adult and youth and children's Sunday school classes. We share announcements which are important for the life and ministry of our church. We recognize that this week uh, the General Assembly is meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we have a large number of our congregation who are there worshiping in Charlotte this Sunday. We have elders who are assisting in communion, others who will be volunteers uh, for the General Assembly. It began yesterday and continues all this week. Uh, I have not had a chance to read the newspaper to find out who was elected moderator, which occurred uh, at some point yesterday. But uh, our prayers are with uh, the General Assembly as representatives meet from the 50 states of the United States from all the various presbyteries. <clears throat> Announcement for the youth. Youth and adults go on a rafting trip today and are to meet in the Rick Brand classroom after the worship service. If that applies to you, you will know where to meet in order to go rafting. That would be a cool way to spend a hot Sunday afternoon. Uh, June 16th is a significant time for me because uh, 10 years ago I arrived in Raleigh, began uh, my ministry with you, and so Martha Dale and I expressed to you our thanks uh, for your love and support and friendship as uh, we uh, remember 10 years of ministry with you here at uh, First Presbyterian Church. We need to remember the following individuals in our thoughts and in our prayers. Uh, at Rex Hospital are Edel Lee Crawley, Everett Nichols, who is in intensive care on support systems, Mary Lou Presley, uh, who uh, had surgery today and perhaps will have more surgery tomorrow, Margaret Sewell, Thornton Sharon. Moved from Rex Hospital to Wake Medical Rehab are Jess Roby and Marie Ellen. Uh, discharged from Rex Hospital this week are Donna Justice and uh, Charlie Bishop. We need to remember the following individuals and in our thoughts and our prayers. Marion Kirkman, a member of the church, 95 years of age, uh, who witnessed the resurrection service was held this past Monday at Graveside at Oakwood. Uh, Phyllis Barham, whose uh, witness the resurrection service was held Tuesday uh, at Mitchell's funeral home. Uh, she is the mother of Bart Barham and grandmother to all the others in the Barham family. Christian sympathy is extended to John Person and the death of his uh, brother Dick Person in Tennessee. Our thoughts and prayers are as well with the mother of John Lagarde, uh, who is seriously ill, but not quite as critical as once thought. We're glad that in the service this morning uh, is John Taylor. John will be heading to Greek school at Princeton. He is one of several of our members who are inquirers or candidates, and we're privileged to have uh, John Taylor assisting in the service of worship this Sunday morning. We will, shall be participating later on in the service uh, with the sacrament of baptism for uh, Mark and Alice Carpenter and family, and uh, participating uh, is the father of Mark, uh, the Reverend Jim Carpenter. His wife, Jane, is an elder. I knew uh, Jim Carpenter before he went into the ministry, and I knew uh, Jane Dykusen, uh, who was a native of New Orleans, and uh, I was a close friend with her two younger siblings, Fred and Sidney Dykusen. They will be participating in the uh, baptism this Sunday morning. It's good for us to be in worship as we gather on this Lord's Day. Let us worship God.
Let us join together in our call to worship from the fifth psalm, and can, which is from the fifth psalm and can be found printed in your worship bulletin. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Give ear to my sighing. Listen to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I pray. O Lord, in the morning I hear, your vo I hear you in my voice. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Spread your protection over them, so that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. Our hymn is, O Worship the King, All Glorious Above. It can be found on page 476 in your pew hymnal. If we claim that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Merciful God, you pardon all who truly repent and turn to you. We humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Create in us a clean heart, O God, 
and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. In Christ's name, amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the God of mercy, who forgives you of all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. <laughs> It is our privilege now as a worshiping community of faith to participate in the sacrament of baptism as Mark and Alice Carpenter present their infant daughter, Emily Catherine Carpenter, for the sacrament of baptism. The ruling elder will be Bard Wilson. Uh, the siblings to Emily will be with her, uh, Jonathan Scott and Janie. It's a tradition in the family, uh, as in ours, that uh, the dad, who is an ordained Presbyterian minister, uh, baptized each of the grandchildren. And so it's a pleasure to have the Reverend uh, Jim Carpenter, who is just retired, correct? <laughs> yes. Well, keep me Pastor for years in Hillsville, Virginia, also served in uh, Martinsville, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, and served as a missionary of the Presbyterian Church. Uh, his wife is an elder, Jane, and uh, I mentioned Jane Dykusen. The Dykusens were very active at the Lakeview Presbyterian Church in New Orleans, and uh, Jane's dad and my dad served together in many capacities in New Orleans Presbytery. Uh, Jane was that older, attractive woman who was a little bit older than her siblings, uh, Fred and Sidney, who were close friends of mine with whom I went to many uh, church functions, Presbyterian camps. So this is a family affair, New Orleans family and uh, the extended family as we participate in the sacrament of baptism this Sunday morning. Let us hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always to the close of the age. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and sure of his presence with us, we baptize those whom he has called to be his own. In Jesus Christ, God has promised to forgive our sins and has joined us together in the family of faith, which is his church. He has delivered us from darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. Jesus Christ, God has promised to be our Father and to welcome us as brothers and sisters of Christ. Mark and Alice know that the promises of God are for you and for your children. By baptism, God puts his sign on you and them to show that all of you belong to him and gives you Holy Spirit as a guarantee that sharing Christ's reconciling work, you and your children will also share in his victory, that dying with Christ to sin, you and they will be raised with him to new life. Alice and Mark, in presenting your child for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ and show that you want her to study him, know him, love him, and serve him as his chosen disciple. Show your purpose by answering these questions. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Do you trust in him? We do. Do you intend for your child to be his disciple, to obey his word, and show his love? Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of the church, promise to tell this new disciple, Emily Catherine Carpenter, the good news of the gospel, to help her know all that Christ commands, 
and by your fellowship to strengthen her family ties with the household of God. The congregation will respond, we do. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your faithfulness promised in this sacrament and for the hope we have in your son Jesus. As we baptize with water, baptize us with Holy Spirit, so that what we say may be your word and what we do may be your work. By your power, may we be made one with Christ our Lord in common faith and purpose. For we make this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah. Emily Catherine Carpenter, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Emily Catherine Carpenter has been received into the Holy Catholic Church, and we who have witnessed her baptism become extensions of her family. Our grandparents, our aunts and uncles, our cousins and nephews, because we, with her blood parents, are those through whom she will know of the love of God in Jesus Christ. And so we celebrate her baptism this Sunday morning. And we'll now present her to you, members of her extended family. And the proud granddad will carry Emily. And Jonathan and Jenny, you want to walk with us too? No, okay. <laughs> well, Jenny will hold my hand. In the Acts of the Apostles, Peter says to those who have assembled, Repent and be baptized, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off. And so in our tradition of the Christian faith, the Reformed Presbyterian tradition, we baptize both children and adults, symbolizing that it is in our weakness that we are brought to faith, that the power of God and Jesus Christ working in our lives enables us to sense with awe and with wonder, the grace working in our lives. So indeed, the baptism of a little child reminds us that it is God who takes the initiative to come to be in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the initiative of God indeed works through not only through the family, but through the church family, the community of faith, the body of Christ. And so we celebrate with family members who are here, with the proud grandparents and siblings, and with Mark and Alice in the baptism of this newest member of the Holy Catholic Church, Emily Catherine. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of all life, you have called us by name and pledged to each of us your faithful love. We pray for your child, Emily. Watch over her, guide her as she grows in faith. Give her understanding and quick concern for neighbors. Help her to become a true disciple of Christ Jesus. God of grace, we pray for these parents, Alice and Mark. Help them to know you, to love with your love, to teach your truth, and to tell the story of Jesus to their children, so that your word may be heard and bring about plans for us as you have promised. In Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Let us stand as we sing together our baptismal response. Again, good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. All visitors and members alike are encouraged at this time to 
engage with us in what we call the ritual of friendship and take the friendship pad which is located on the inside of the pew and sign it and especially if you're a visitor we encourage you to put your name and address so that we might um, be in touch with you about our worship service and invite you back again also it will help those in your row that are members um, learn your name and greet you after the worship service also if you're a visitor in the on the pew card in front of you, there's a red ribbon that we encourage you to pin to your lapel or your blouse so that those who are not in your row and don't have the benefit of the friendship pad might introduce themselves to you and welcome you and greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Also, individuals who are visiting with us today that are interested in membership or joining our church by profession of faith, reaffirmation of faith, or transfer of letter, are asked and encouraged to meet with an elder representative following the service of worship in the session room, which is to the left of the pulpit when you're looking forward. Um, there will be someone there to talk to you about how to become a member here at our church. Also, after the worship service, there is a time of fellowship and coffee in the Bauckham Parlor, which is to the right of the sanctuary as you exit through the rear door. And we invite all members and visitors for that time of coffee and fellowship after the worship services. The ministers, after greeting at the door, will be there to greet you as well. Again, we are glad you're here with us today for this Lord's Day and worship service. Now let us join together in the singing of our hymn, Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us, number 387. All who are able, please stand. Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson comes from the 21st chapter of the book of Kings verses 1 through 10, and then verses 15 through 21a. Let us hear God's word as it is directed to us. 
Later, the following events took place. Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. And Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard so that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near my house. I will give you a better vineyard for it or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give you my ancestral inheritance. Ahab went home resentful and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. For he had said, I will not give you my ancestral inheritance. He lay down on his bed, turned away his face, and would not eat. His wife Jezebel came to him and said, Why are you so depressed that you will not eat? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard for it. But he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. His wife Jezebel said to him, Do you now govern Israel? Get up, eat some food, and be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. She sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who lived, in Naboth, who lived with Naboth in his city. She wrote in the letters, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth, in, and seat Naboth at the head of the assembly. See two scoundrels opposite him, and have them bring a charge against him, saying, You have cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. As soon as Jeze Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Go take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. As soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab sent out to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Go down to meet King Ahab of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. You shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, have you killed and also taken possession? You shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, dogs will also lick up your blood. Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to, what it, to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. I will bring disaster on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson this morning comes to us from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. Paul writes, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who I loved, who loved me 
and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, one of the lectionary passages for this second Sunday after Pentecost, which is known in some circles as ordinary time, this long period of time after the day of Pentecost, before Advent, which focuses on how we witness to the faith we profess. Several of you asked for a copy of the sermon from last Sunday on the Trinity, and copies may be found at the back of the sanctuary on those glass cabinets under which are the memorial books. We focus this Sunday though on the topic, gratitude, the response of the forgiven, as we read from the Gospel of Luke, the seventh chapter, beginning at verse 36 and continuing through the third verse of chapter 8. Hear now God's word directed to us. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, and Suanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their resources. The word of the Lord, thanks be to our God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious day on this Lord's day, we too are those who come out of a sense of gratitude for the gift of life, of forgiveness and a hope which is ours in Jesus Christ. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We can be grateful for so many things. I was mentioning to uh, several members of the choir this morning, I was grateful for sleep when I get it. Last night I didn't get much. I was awakened at 2.30 in the morning by a desperate call from a young lady whose marriage service I had officiated for last night, and it was just a very pitiful cry on the telephone, 2.30 a.m. She had to get into the church 
to find her suitcase, which had her passport in it and her belongings, and she was leaving had, on an international flight and had to uh, be at the airport at 6 o'clock. Believe me, I'm grateful for sleep I've gotten on other nights. <laughs> we are grateful for many other things, though, particularly when we have survived some personal crisis or calamity, even though we have been scarred. After Hurricane Fran swept through North Carolina in 1996 in, in September, uh, there were those of you who came to the church on days after that to pray in the sanctuary and the chapel to offer thanksgiving to God. There were very few casualties in North Carolina, but there were some casualties, and many people were hurt, particularly those uh, in the coastal areas. But most of us here in Raleigh came out the next morning dumbstruck at the devastation which had occurred. But we were grateful that somehow, in spite of it all, and it was a lot of devastation, that we, uh, we you know, had not been seriously hurt, and our loved ones not hurt. It is normal that we tend to be more grateful to God after a personal calamity and crisis. And so the question, how do we resist the temptation to wane, to diminish in our gratitude to God? Our scriptures help us to wrestle with that question. The scripture from, gospel, from the Gospel of Luke enables us to wrestle with gratitude which grows out of a deep spiritual need. Luke, in our gospel lesson, presents a contrast between two individuals, Simon, the self-righteous, arrogant, callous individual, and the woman, whom scholars have labeled the woman of the night, the prostitute, a woman, a sinner. Both responses are different to Jesus. Undoubtedly, Simon is a prima donna type who likes to collect celebrities as they pass through his village. Uh, and the way this was done in his era was to throw a big meal, a banquet, in order to have provocative conversation so that uh, when the guests arrived, uh, they could be part of this provocative conversation, but more to to enable the townspeople to gather around to, to be part of this, because this was the oriental custom. When you had a meal for a guest, basically it was a public event. Everybody could come. You, they didn't have any windows, or, or so people could lean in. Or if you, if you got there ahead of time, you could come in and take your place along the wall to listen to the conversation around mealtime. And to say, oh, what a, what, a, what a good comment. And of course, this was said loud enough so that the, the host would feel gratified and, and, and the ego could be built. And Simon must have had uh, a reputation for doing this. Larry King collects celebrities to be on his TV show, Larry King Live. However, if Jesus is an example, Larry King treats his guests differently. Simon didn't even extend the normal Middle Eastern customs. At least Larry King provides all the niceties when you come on his TV show, whether you are an athlete or an ex-president or a sitting president. Not so with Simon. He's such a prima donna that he doesn't do any of this. Simon does not extend to Jesus the normal courtesy of washing his feet. Simon does not provide the kiss of welcome. Simon does not provide the ointment, uh, which is a sign of, of, of hospitality, and more likely it was placed on the nap of the neck. Uh, very important, and when people didn't bathe very often, and they smelled, and so at least this provided a fragrant aroma around you because the person sitting next to you may smell worse than you smell to them. So uh, it was a form of hospitality uh, to, to provide this. And none of that was provided Jesus as a guest. Well, there is this contrast. Contrast. But there's another personality there, in, in addition to Simon and Jesus and the guest. She too has heard that Jesus has come. She knows his reputation. 
Because Jesus is at Simon's home, he is there because he has the reputation of being a rebel rabbi, a, a, a rabbi who goes against the grain, a rabbi who has flaunted uh, a lot of the, the rituals. And so she has heard that he is a friend of sinners, and she has come. And she is standing probably inside, has gotten inside, along the periphery of the wall. Now, according to Oriental custom, uh, these folks eat differently than you and I eat. They eat reclining on the ground, with their feet in back of them, with one elbow propping up the, their head, and more likely they, it is the left because they've got to reach with the right hand. And that's another Oriental custom, which we won't go into. Uh, and I have great appreciation for how, for how people can sit on the floor to eat. In Korea, I had great difficulty crossing my legs. It would have been much easier if I too could have reclined, stretched them out in back of me. But here in the gospel lesson is the contrast. The contrast of Simon and the woman. Indeed, the woman is here because of great spiritual need. She knows that she is a sinner and she has great remorse. The lectionary passages talk about another woman who is much like Simon, Jezebel. She has no sense of being a sinner. She has no sense of remorse. She is arrogant. She, she loves the position she is in as queen. She is calloused. She is entirely different than this woman who is present. Jezebel is arrogant and calloused. Simon is arrogant and calloused. Indeed, Simon participates in the law of righteousness. He does not sense that he's much of a sinner at all. No sinner at all, for he has kept all of the dietary and the rituals which enable him to have a sense of security. Paul talks about individuals like that who live under that law of righteousness instead of justification by faith, believing in what Jesus accomplished through the cross. She is present with great spiritual need, a sinner. And she knows from what she has heard early on as Luke presents it, Jesus is a friend of the tax collectors and the sinners. She's so overcome with her condition, her spiritual need, that she senses that somehow if Jesus is a friend of, a, of sinners, that somehow he would be a friend to her. So spontaneously, because of her great need, she steps forward, startles all, and does the unthinkable. She takes her vial, which she carries around her neck, tears streaming. She bends down and pours that on Jesus' feet as her tears hit his feet, and her hair is used to wipe his feet. She, she performs all of the rituals which Simon should have performed, but she does it in a most unorthodox way. But what a contrast between this woman of the night and the self-righteous Pharisee. The woman who knows that she is a sinner because she has great spiritual need, and the woman who knows that somehow if she can relate to Jesus, she can relate to him out of gratitude for what he can do for her by accepting her and claiming her because this is his reputation. And indeed, Jesus does not fail her. Simon, though, is different. Simon's greatest sin is that he thinks he is not a sinner. He has sinned so little because he has kept all of the rituals and the rites. In fact, he thinks Jesus is some kind of dumb rabble, rabbi because Jesus is so dumb he does not recognize who and what this woman is. For no respecting Pharisee or rabbi would ever let such a person touch him because Jesus now has been labeled ritually unclean. Yet Jesus' actions toward this woman express a wisdom far greater than that of the Pharisee and the works of righteousness mentality. Jesus reflects the divine wisdom of a sacrificial love of God which is flowing through him, which Paul in another epistle describes as the foolishness of the cross, a sacrificial love which claims us in our vulnerability and our weakness to forgive us, to heal us, to restore us, 
to enable us to begin anew and afresh. And so Jesus responds to Simon, gives him a parable with an obvious answer. An individual had made two loans, one for 500 denarii and one for 50, and then he forgave them both, and he asked, who would express greater love to the person in debt? Well, the obvious answer is the one who owed him the most. Simon, as a calloused individual, because Simon had never sensed that he was much of a sinner, had never asked for forgiveness, and because of that, Simon does not have a compassionate heart to know the vulnerability of others because he thinks he's above that. He's superior to all that. And so Simon does not need to forgive others because he has not sensed a need to forgive. And because Simon cannot forgive, Simon cannot love. And so Jesus tells Simon in the hearing of all, the one who is forgiven little loves little. And the implication is the one who is forgiven much can love much. God loves much not because God has sinned, God loves much, and God forgives much. And friends, that's good news to you and me. It is out of a deep sense of spiritual need that the woman responds. It is indeed out of a great spiritual sense of our own need that we live out of gratitude to God because we are those who have been healed, who have been restored, who by faith in Jesus Christ claim the hope which is ours of the gospel, that life can begin anew. There is no unforgiven sin. There is no one of us who is rejected. There is no unforgiven sin. No unforgiven sin. And that's good news. And it leads to gratitude. It leads to gratitude. But secondly, gratitude from the forgiven leads to service. In answer to the question which was asked in the introduction, how do we resist the temptation to wane, to diminish in our gratitude, we find here an understanding to that question. It is in service that we acknowledge that every day we live in gratitude to God because it is in service that we are reminded why it is that we are grateful to God. It is in service and the small things, which are really the big things. It is interesting here in this gospel that there is this focus on women and their ministry and service to Jesus. This insignificant woman who was considered dirt by the Pharisee renders great service to Jesus. In these three verses of chapter 8 are mentioned three women, unsung heroes, who have been ministered to in their spiritual need by Jesus and who have responded out of gratitude by providing the wherewithal for Jesus and his disciples to engage in ministry and has mentioned that there are several others unnamed. It is in the small things of life each day that we serve God in the service of others that we respond in gratitude. It is in the service of others as we worship God in our service of gratitude that we are able to resist the temptation of arrogance and self-sufficiency which are fueled by sin. It is in the small things each day that we worship God and show gratitude to God in service by which we are grateful. William Barclay is a deceased a biblical scholar who taught for many years at Glasgow University in the Divinity School. And he's a tremendous storyteller. And he tells the story of a divinity student who studied under him and who told him this story. The student in Glasgow lived, as most students did uh, there, outside of the university. They don't provide dormitories. They did a long time ago. Now there are some dormitories around these universities in Scotland. But he had a small garret in, a, in, in an apartment. And he struck up a friendship with a shoe cobbler. The divinity student was from a small community on the Isle of Skye. And he was the first one from his family ever to pass the boards and exams to make it into university. And he had this call to ministry. The cobbler, as it turned out, many years before had had a sense of call to ministry, but because of circumstances and responsibilities, could not get into university. 
And all these years he had this burning passion of what it was, what he could have been, what could have been if he had answered the call to ministry. And so in the friendship, the cobbler began to live vicariously through all of the discipline of study which the young student went through at the university. And when the young student got to the place where it was time to graduate and he had his first call to an assistant ship at a parish church in Glasgow, the cobbler was excited as a young man. And he made a peculiar request. But it really showed his gratitude to God for the young man and for the opportunity for service in a very unusual way. He said, would he be allowed the privilege for as long as he lived to provide the shoes to the young man? Vicariously, in gratitude to God, he would provide the shoes by which the young man in turn would serve God. How many individuals are there in our lives who in gratitude to God have nudged us along, who have encouraged us along, who have forgiven us, who have enabled us to be erect again after falling, after failure. How many of those have assisted us for whom we are grateful to God? And indeed, we become then the instruments of doing that for others in the many small ways by which we live. Indeed, out of great spiritual need, we are gratitude, and we express our gratitude to God in terms of how we serve God in life, all of life the small things, the big things, but every day. For as we gather as the church today, it is out of gratitude that we are here to give thanksgiving to God. And in Reformed tradition, these walls become transparent, for when we walk out of here, we are the church scattered, and we give gratitude to God for how we live our lives in the workplace, in the social and political indices of life. It is there that we show our gratitude for God for affirming the faith we profess in Jesus Christ, affirming the worth of people, living as forgiven Christians, sinners saved by grace, not superior to, but a fellow journeyer in life with others out there whom we affirm in Jesus Christ. Well, out of great spiritual need, the woman expressed her gratitude. And this gratitude was seen in her service she rendered to our Lord, and that is the model for us, a model which comes from one of the least of these, we too, like Simon, can never be so arrogant or so elevated that we think we are superior to any one of God's children. We too are called upon to die to sin and to be raised to new life as we expressed in the sacrament of baptism. Gratitude is the life of a forgiven sinner, and we live it out in service to our Lord. When the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has, told, has relayed to us Whoever loses life for my sake will find it. Amen. Now, having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us affirm our faith in our risen Lord Jesus Christ using the words of the traditional Apostles' Creed. Would you please stand and say together with me, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
please be seated. Now let us unite our hearts and our minds in a time of prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, creator of this awesome world and giver of all things bright and beautiful, we give you thanks and praise that according to the promise of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came upon the whole church and that the gospel is everlasting, that this should be preached among all people and be, bring us and them out of darkness and into clear light of your truth. And we pray, O oh God, give us such awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we will show forth your praise and glory, not only with our words, but in our actions and our deeds, by giving of ourselves to your service and walking before you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. Help us to be a light to the world shining bright with love and thanksgiving, knowing that Christ is our Savior and your Spirit dwells among us. Lord of all life, we come before you with humble hearts, thankful that we can bring our prayers and petitions to you, lay them before you, and know that you are willing and longing to respond in your way according to your will. Great God of compassion, we pray especially for the leaders of our church as they meet together in Charlotte for the General Assembly. Guide those who represent us that they may be guided by your will and to further the work of your church as you see fit. O oh God, inspire your whole church, not only our church, and its people with the spirit of love, that peace and unity might be found in the midst of turbulence and difficult times. Grant that all who trust you may receive your word and live together in love. O oh God, many nations struggle with conflict from within. Help the leaders of the world to guide people and the powers that be in the, in the way of justice and goodwill. Help them in these times of instability. We pray, O oh God, for friends and family within our own church. Give us wisdom and understanding to be witnesses to your word to the world. Grant us peace and healing and forgiveness. We lift up to you, especially those names that have been mentioned before you, of those in the hospital, those who are grieving losses, those who are at home convalescing. We also pray for the many who have not been mentioned, but weigh heavy on our hearts. Comfort and relieve, O Lord, all who suffer from afflictions of body, mind, or spirit. We pray all this through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us receive God's tithes and our morning offerings.
We pause, O oh God, to give you thanks for the many gifts and blessings you have bestowed upon us, your children. We dedicate to you these our offerings that we may be guided in your will to use them to further the work and service of your church. We pray all this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us join together in the singing of our closing hymn, called as Partners in Christ's Service, number 343. We will sing the first and the last verses. May we live as those who claim Jesus Christ, God who has claimed us, forgiven us, restored us, healed us, and equipped us to live life each day in gratitude. And indeed, may we do so in all the issues of life, serving God and serving others, and thus living a life of gratitude as those who have been forgiven and reclaimed. And now the grace of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>